Good afternoon, everyone. Mm, rousing response. You guys still on vacation time, huh? I hope you had a good Memorial Day weekend. I hope it was filled with a barbecue, relaxing, uh, and also remembering and, and celebrating the memory of those that we know who have served and, and some who've even paid the price for it. Um, but I always want to be thankful for those who are, are willing to lay down their lives. And, and we, every now and then we'll dance around or touch on some political issues and things like that. And there are so many surrounding issues of military and all this stuff. But the one thing that everyone can agree on is someone who is willing to give their lives for the sake of others, that is a noble and a virtuous thing. And so we do want to be thankful of that rather than get cynical, especially in times where uh, we may doubt country leadership or whatever, depending on, depending on who's in office and which side of the aisle you're on. There's always going to be somebody upset about. But um, so I hope you had a good weekend. Hope you were thankful and able to spend it with friends and family. And I'm glad that you're here. I consider this group friends and family, and I hope you do too. Uh, I know sometimes it's, it's easy to get in, you know, our tables and talk to just the people at our tables, but we always want to be mindful of like, this is gathering. This is the body of Christ and everybody here that comes, whether a believer or not, you know, we always want to be welcome and hospitable. So it's just a helpful thing to do because we do have new people that come and visit every now and then. And one of the nicest things is when somebody's new to something and someone else steps up and says, hey, welcome. What's your name? What's your story? Glad you're here. You can sit with us if you need to, you know, all that kind of stuff. And if they're an introvert, they'll just say no, thank you. And they'll sit by themselves. But that's OK, because you made the effort and were hospitable. And that's what counts. And this group's really good at that, by the way. You guys are awesome. So I want to thank you for that. We're in number 17. Excuse me, numbers 18. Um, <clears throat> this section of numbers, this is the end of this generation. This is the generation that came out of Egypt. This is the generation that stood around the base of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. It's easy to forget because we're like two and a half years separated from that in this study. You know, some of you were here during it. Some of you have been here since Genesis. But it's easy to, for, to think that that was so long ago. But it wasn't for them. I mean, this is, this is the same generation. So they, <clears throat> all of the events of the Exodus are their background. And so it's important to constantly keep that in mind. And especially Exodus 19 and 20. Exodus 19 and 20 are just fundamental for understanding everything having to do with the tabernacle, I think. I would suggest. Because the tabernacle is a portable model representation of Mount Sinai. That's why there's concentric layers. That's why certain people can only come so close. And others can come closer. And others can come closer. And that's why there's the threat of death around it all. Because that's what Mount Sinai was. Mount Sinai was God's holy mountain. And God even said back in Exodus 19, you know, make borders around the mountain. So the people don't push their way up or come up or approach me in their innate sinfulness, approach me without mediation and thus pay the consequences of their sin. Because when a sinful people come in contact with a holy God, one of those things is going to give. And it's not the holy God. It's the sinful humanity. And as we saw in Exodus, God's holiness is not you know, fluffy bunnies and fields and sunsets and meadows. God's holiness is a blast furnace. God's holiness is a fire that consumes and purifies. If you want an imagery of God's holiness, go to a glass blowing factory or go to a metal working uh, a, a blacksmith. Watch how they purify things like metal and glass. Watch how they separate the, the dross from the pure, good, valuable material. They do it by putting it in a blast furnace, by literally burning away the impurities so that what remains is what can survive. And that's the image Paul uses in the New Testament. First Corinthians, he uses that image to describe Christian work and church work in particular in ministry. And he says that's what everybody's going to face. We're all, all our work's going to be tested by fire. And only what's built with, with the precious building materials is what's going to survive. All the straw, all the stubble, all the stuff made of just human efforts, it's all going to be burned away. And so that image, it's a, it's, a, it's a both testament image. God's purity and holiness is the holiness of a blast furnace. It's the holiness of fire. 
and it's something that we largely in evangelical North American Christianity tend to lose because the revolution that came about going back to the middle of last century in particular with the rise of uh, neo-evangelicalism and crusades, Billy Graham, John Ockengay, Carl Henry, all these awesome, amazing works that God did in this country through those things, bringing people to faith and Campus Crusade and you know, Bill Bright and uh, all this... They were, it was good. It was good. But in every good thing, there can be excess. In every good thing, there can be a twisting. In fact, that's what Satan does. He can't create anything on his own. He can only twist and distort what God already created. And so in that, in our culture, what's been kind of twisted and distorted is the communal aspect of the body of Christ. We have focused on things like steps to peace with God, the four spiritual laws, the Romans road, saying the sinner's prayer, all of those things to get individual people to make their pledge to, to, to get saved as we call it and then that's it you made it you got your ticket to heaven and that is not that that's wrong but it is woefully incomplete it's 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 just not even scratching the surface of what it means to be a follower of the Lord a covenant member of God's people because God's people were inherently communal. And so there was an aspect of, yes, God does differentiate guilt. He does not punish the innocent for the sins of the guilty. But at the same time, He does allow the communities to experience the results of the sins of members of that community. And that's a tricky thing to hold in balance. And the prophets have to do that later. Ezekiel has to wrestle with that. And Habakkuk has to wrestle with that. That, yes, God can allow groups to suffer the consequences of something that they as an individual didn't do. But that's not the same thing as saying, because this person sinned, you're guilty of their sin. It's two different things. It's not just semantics. It's a very real difference. And we've lost track of, I think, largely that idea of, of corporate solidarity that something happens to the body, it happens to all of us, and we're all invested in it. So things like church abuse scandals. We were like, well, I'm not Catholic. That doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. It does affect you. It's a scandal on the body of Christ. You know, the, 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 the abuses of any part of the Christian faith or the, the scandals that any aspect of the body goes through, it affects us all because we're one body. That doesn't mean you're guilty. It doesn't mean you're responsible for a, an abusive minister or priest, or, or, or layperson, or whatever. It doesn't mean you're, you're responsible, but it does mean that you are part of the body that is experiencing the effects of that sinfulness. And so that's something that, again, we have to be aware because we've tended to swing to the far end of individualism because it fits with this culture, this country. We're an individual country. You know, we have our rights. And, and it's not that those are wrong. Those are good. Rights are good. Individual rights are a good thing. Uh, liberty, good thing. But... Anything taken to its extreme can be dangerous, and that's one of the aspects is we lose that communal sense. And so Numbers, <clears throat> this section that we're in in Numbers is all about that. When, when a part of the community rebels, that, that rebellion infects and works its way throughout like yeast through dough. And, and pretty soon, the entire community bears the brunt of that. And we've seen that in the previous chapters with the rebellion. And then in the last chapter, God established, look, there was a vying for power. And there was one group that was saying, we want the prerogatives of the priest because the priests control the people. I mean, that goes in every culture and every religion. That's why skeptics say, ah, oh, religion was just a way to keep people in line. No, that's a dumb argument. But there's a kernel of truth in it that, yes, true religious people, true religious order does control the behavior of the people who follow it. That is the true part. Now, that can be abused, and in various cultures and religions, it has been abused. But it doesn't mean that that's, there's not a true aspect to that. And so the people, in this case, uh, Korah and his folks, they were seeking to rebel, to claim that, to grasp that power of religious authority, of the priesthood, and thus the leadership of the people. That's what they were trying to grasp. In, in, in contrast to that, think about the Christ hymn in Philippians chapter 2 where it says Jesus didn't see His divinity as something to be grasped or to be grabbed or to be used for His own purpose, but rather He emptied Himself, becoming nothing and suffering death on a cross. That, Philippians 2, I know it's an Old Testament study, but there's a thing called the New Testament 
and it has some letters that Paul wrote, and that's one of them. Anyway, back to what the real Bible. Um, no, I'm only kidding. That's all the Bible. But um, in, in this section, in 18, uh, or in 17 rather, there was that act of rebellion, trying to seize political power, which was also religious power, and the two were intertwined, and there were two factions of rebels that came together, one for political reasons, one for uh, religious reasons, but they were both united in their rebellion. God vindicated dramatically the authority of Moses and the authority of Aaron in the chapter right before this, saying that, no, it is through Aaron's line that the priests will come. You Levites, I've given you your job and your roles, but Aaron's line are going to be the priests. And so now, at the end, there was this display of Aaron's rod was the one that budded in, with the almond blossoms, which we said there's a word play in there is because the, the almonds have the connotation of God watching. And that's, you can read about that in Jeremiah 1. But God's giving this sign like, hey, I'm watching. I see what's going on and I know who my chosen anointed priesthood family is. So don't try to take it because bad things will happen if you do. And the people ended, chapter uh, 17 ended with them crying out, basically like, we're all going to die, we're all going to die. And it was just this cry of despair from this generation that had rebelled, that had suffered the consequences, and that had no hope for a future because they had forfeited the, the, the salvation that God wanted to bring them into. And so now, in chapter 18 then, God's going to summarize, He's going to give a, a, a kind of a final Hey, Levites, this is what I'm calling you to. And within the Levites, hey, priests, this is what I'm calling you to. There's a gradation. There's all of Israel, then there's the Levites, and then there's the priests. It, it narrows in the closer you get to the top of Mount Sinai. At the bottom of all the people, up the mountain a little bit, the elders could come. Up at the very top, only Aaron and Moses and Joshua. And, and then at the very, very top, only Moses. So that is mirrored, that is replicated, recapitulated in the tabernacle system outside all of Israel, then the outer courts areas where the Levites do their work, and then the inner court of the tabernacle is where the priests do their work, and then the very Holy of Holies is where only the high priest can go and only once a year. So that's why the tabernacle is like, it's like you took Mount Sinai and you just flatten it down. And that's, you know, you ever seen those, uh, what are those bowls that you can like flat, you, you know, you, they're like portable camping, camping bowls, right? You pop them up and they're like layered cakes. And then when you're ready, to, you turn it over and you use it. And then when you're ready to collapse it, you turn it over, you collapse it back down. Think of the tabernacle that way, of Mount Sinai being collapsed down. And you have these concentric rings of holiness that correspond to the levels of the mountain. Does that help? I just came up with that on the spot, but I might use that in the future. So <laughs> just think of it that way. <clears throat> Copyright 2017, Disciple Dojo, those of you watching on camera. Um, so here's what he says then to the Levites and to the priests, because they have a big job. Their job literally is to guard. When God tells them this is the work you're going to do, guard and keep the tabernacle, the, the tent of meeting. Guard and keep. That's the same command God initially gave Adam, by the way, when he put the man in the garden. And the text says to work it and take care of it. It literally to guard and to keep it. Adam, Adam and Eve were the first priestly. Anyway, that's a bigger theological connection, but it's there. Um, because Israel and the priesthood and all of this is recapitulating this, this attempt for God to dwell in the midst of His people. It all points back to Eden and it all points forward to the New Jerusalem. And that's the beauty of high-level biblical theology when you get the 30,000-foot view. But let's zoom down to like a 100-foot view and go through this passage. I'm going to read it in big chunks and just point out a few things. The Lord said to Aaron, you, your sons, and your father's family are to bear the responsibility for offenses against the sanctuary. You and your sons alone are to bear the responsibility for offenses against the priesthood. Bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you and assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the testimony. They are to be responsible to you and are to perform all the duties of the tent. That would include like butchering the animals and preparing the sacrifices and, and, and moving and breaking down and transporting. That's what he's talking about. But they must not go near the furnishings of the sanctuary or the altar or both they and you will die. That's only the priest could do that. 
So the Levites are kind of guarding the tabernacle from the rest of the Israelites getting too close. So the Levites are the first layer of buffering between this blast furnace God and the people uh, that he's camped in the midst of. Verse 4, so they are to join you and be responsible for the care of the tent of meeting, all the work of the tent, and no one else may come near where you are. There's a wordplay here too that's missing in English. It says twice to join, to join the Levites. If you think back to Genesis 28, 29, when Levi was born, like the actual guy, Levi, the son, he was born to, I believe it was Leah, Jacob's uh, first wife, and she wanted, she, she, if you go back to Genesis, and those of you here, you can check the video on our YouTube page all the way back to Genesis 28, 29, but basically Rachel and Leah had this kind of breeding battle, how many, who could make the most sons, and uh, Leah was winning, and then so Rachel's maidservant, she made her a surrogate, so she started having them, and then Leah got her maidservant, she started having them, and then Rachel had a son, and then eventually had another one, but it was this really dysfunctional, I mean, Israel's a super dysfunctional family in the Old Testament, and the third son, so Reuben, Simeon, then Levi, the third son, by the third son, Leah says, it says, basically, she hoped that, oh, now since I've given him a third son, finally, I'll be joined to him. And so she names the third son Levi from the verb to join to, or to, be atta- to become attached to. It's really sad. Like there's just this desire, oh, just now he'll love me because I've given him a third son. And yet he still loved her sister more. And so it's very sad. But this is, there's a wordplay on that, that, that the Levites to join. Now God is using that verb and saying, yeah, Levites, you're going to join. You're going to be joined to my work in the temple. I'm going to be your inheritance. I'm going to be the thing that your ancestor Levi, that his mother never got from her husband. You know, I, I'm, you're going to join. It's a really neat use of that word that gets glossed over in, in English because it join and Levi don't sound anything alike. But then he goes on to say, verse 5, you are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar so that wrath will not fall on the Israelites again as it just did in the previous two sections that we've read. So check last week and the week before for what that means. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you dedicated to the Lord to do the work at the tent of meeting. But only you and your sons, that's Aaron's line, may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary must be put to death. Mount Sinai. You don't just barge up Mount Sinai. There's a gradation of of access. This is the paradox of the Old Testament. God wants to dwell among His people, but God's people's sinfulness makes that not a reality. So what does He do? He figures a way to dwell among them with this system that's a giant object lesson on concepts of atonement and intermediary and priesthood that will come to its fruition and its fullness in Jesus as the high priest. And so it's setting the trajectory for a whole bunch of New Testament concepts that we all take for granted like salvation and being able to pray and approach God directly and not having a mediator and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's in the future from, the, from their perspective. <clears throat> so, verse 8, Then the Lord said to Aaron, I myself have put you in charge of the offerings presented to me. All the holy offerings the Israelites give me, I give to you and your sons as your portion and regular share. You are to have the part of the most holy offerings that's kept from the fire. From all the gifts they bring me as most holy offerings, whether grain or sin offerings or guilt offerings, that part belongs to you and your sons. Eat it as something most holy. Every male shall eat it. You must regard it as holy. This also is yours. Whatever is set aside from the gifts of all the wave offerings of the Israelites, I give this to you and your sons and daughters as your regular share. Everyone in your household who is ceremonially clean may eat it. I give you all the finest olive oil and all the finest new wine and grain they give the Lord as the first fruits of their offering. All the land's first fruits that they bring to the Lord will be yours. Everyone in your household who is ceremonially clean may eat it. Everything in Israel that is devoted to the Lord's is yours. The first offspring of every womb, both man and animal, that's offered to the Lord is yours. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. Because you can't sacrifice those. 
When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver, according to the sanctuary shekel, shekel, which is 20 geras, as you all, I'm sure, knew. But you must not redeem the firstborn of an ox, a sheep, or a goat. They are holy. Sprinkle their blood on the altar, burn their fat as an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Their meat is to be yours, just as the breast of the wave offering and the right thigh are yours. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as your regular share. It's an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. Covenant of salt is a phrase. That's a, that's a phrase that was used in the ancient world and in ancient Israel and it, to, to mean a binding covenant, an imperishable covenant, a covenant that won't decay or wear away because that's what salt was, a preservative, and it was a seasoning and a flavoring and it's how you kept meat from rotting and all of this kind of stuff. So that phrase, covenant of salt, that's what that means. It's a wordplay. In this, what God is saying is pretty profound for understanding ministry in ancient Israel. The Levites, okay, you got 12 tribes. Out of those tribes, God said, I'm going to take you into this promised land and you're all going to get this land flowing with milk and honey. That was their inheritance. That's what they would look forward to. But one of the tribes, the Levites, God has said all along, from all the way back in Exodus, except you. You guys don't get inheritance in the land. You don't get land to dwell, to, to raise crops and flocks and herds and all that. Why? Because you got something else to do. You're going to be, among all the Israelites in the towns, you're going to be the ones who mediate between me and between them. You're going to be that buffer. You're going to be, that's your role. So that could seem pretty dismal in an agrarian society. You know, like that's how you get rich by breeding animals or raising crops. I mean, that's your way of living. So this is like God saying, basically, you're not going to have access to, to wealth. You're not going to be able to make your wealth. That's pretty harsh consequences in this world. So to keep everything working, he tells the rest of the tribes, all you tribes, everything you bring in, take the first 10% of it, the first tenth. You bring that to the temple, you bring that to the Levites, and it's theirs. See how it works? The people bring their tenth, and they give it to God. It's called God's. It's the tithe. But the majority of that, I mean, some of it was burned up on the altar as a whole burnt offering, and that's for Leviticus. Those of you who were here last year, if you weren't, check the videos. You can read all about what we studied through the offerings. Some of the offerings, only one of them was given completely to God. In other words, burned up entirely. The rest of the offerings were how they got their meat. That's how they made their dishes, like this. This would have originally been an offering at some point in the temple or the tabernacle. It's how they ate. It's how they lived. It's part of their culture. So denying the Levites the ability to raise crops and herds would be like starving them. So in order to, to not have that happen, God said, hey, rest of you tribes that I'm not calling to put your lives on the line ministering in my presence, you pay the Levites. You pay me by paying the Levites. I consider what you give to the Levites as being given to me. Why? Because they are my servants. They're doing the work and they are putting their lives on the line for you. I mean, literally in Israel, that's what they were doing. He says it right here. Verse 20, the Lord said to Aaron, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your inheritance. I am your share among the Israelites. I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. From now on, the Israelites must not go near the tent of meeting or they will bear the consequences of their sin and die. It is the Levites who are to do the work at the tent of meeting and bear the responsibility for offenses against it. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. They will receive no inheritance among the Israelites. Instead, I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. That is why I said concerning them, they will have no inheritance among the Israelites. So what God intends, the way they're going to live is through the faithful giving of the people that they are ministering to. This is an Old Testament concept that does get carried over into the New Testament. Twice, Paul references this system when he's having discussions, one with Timothy, one with the church at Corinth, about why ministers should be provided for by their congregations and not have to work a second and a third job in order to also do ministry. So it's relevant in both testaments. Now, it's very easy to be abused 
And it was abused from the earliest days. We're going to read in the Old Testament about uh, the people in the time of Samuel, how the sons of Eli were just uh, completely abusing the offerings that people were bringing. It's a system that is so easy to be taken advantage of, and yet, it's a system God puts in place. Implying that there will be abuses, there will be excesses, but yet, it is still how God desires for everyone in His kingdom and His family to be taken care of. Everyone connected, everyone looking out for everyone else, and particularly those who are doing the service, spiritual service of ministry, to be provided for from among the people that they minister to. Not to be extravagantly given, not to live like kings. That's how it gets twisted by modern preachers. No, God's not giving the Levites a jet or a mansion or any of this other garbage that you see preachers heretically parading around as if it's proof from God blessing. And I'm being forceful about that because it's a serious problem in our country and in the developing world where people literally starve to death but their pastors live like kings. It's horrible. It's an abomination. It's from the pits of hell. I cannot be any clearer than that. But it's based on a truth that is very much relevant. That ministers, people doing the work of ministry, should not have to scrape by while the people to whom they minister live large. God blesses us so that we can then bless others. And in particular, that's how He provided for the Levites to make their living. But, let me finish with this. They're not done. The Levites aren't off the hook. Verse 25, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites the tithe I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. In other words, you don't have wine presses and threshing floors and grain. Your offering, though, is still tithable. In other words, you're, you're, people are tithing to you, but you've got to pay it forward. So, uh, verse 29. Yeah. No, 28, sorry. In this way you will present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. From these tithes you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron the priest. You must present as the Lord's portion the best and the holiest part of everything given to you. Say to the Levites, when you present the best part, it will be reckoned to you as the product of the threshing floor or the wine press. You and your households may eat the rest of it anywhere, for it's your wages for your work at the tent of meeting. By presenting the best part of it, you will not be guilty in this matter. Then you will not defile the holy things of the Israelites and you will not die. So it's very severe, but it's also there's every part of the system is required to be in place and to be working. So the Israelites, they've been given land by God, will be given land by God. And, and God says, now from that land, you're going to bring a tenth. If everybody does that, no one will be in need. From that tenth, the Levites that get that tenth to live on, they're going to take a tenth, and they're going to take the best tenth. Literally in Hebrew, it's the fat of the offering. So in Hebrew, the fat means the best part of. Just remember that when you start feeling uh, body image issues. Uh, the fat of blank means the best part of blank. Just cultivating my best parts. Um, so, the, tent, the tithes come in, the best part of the tithes, that will go to Aaron's family, to the priests. Priests, Levites, Israel, all the nations. That's how God said it, so that things are flowing. And then Aaron then, that's how Aaron, because the, the, the Aaron's family, the priests, are literally doing the, the most dangerous work. So the person who's doing the most dangerous work gets paid a little more on most jobs, hazard pay. That's what this is. Old Testament hazard pay. And as we've just seen in the previous two chapters, stepping to the altar is a hazardous thing in this world, in this covenant. That's why in the new covenant, when the curtain is torn from top to bottom, and the author of Hebrews says, now we can approach the throne of God with boldness, that's mind-blowing. That's a new thing. But it's something we've grown up with, so it just becomes old hat. But that's why studying it back then helps us see what it is that we're experiencing today. We're out of time. Next week, final chapter from this generation. God's going to talk about now two chapters. In this two chapters we've read, a couple of thousand people have died. 
So Israel's impure, and there's a lot of impurity. And because you know how it said everyone who is ceremonially clean can eat? Well, death is the thing that renders you ceremonially unclean, and those things that mimic or, or bring to mind death. So all of Israel is massively unclean right now. We're still all in one event going on, even though it's stretched out over weeks because of how we meet. So next week, God's going to do the final thing, which is, okay, purification for this death stuff. Then the whole generation dies. And then we start Numbers round two, the new generation. Numbers 2.0. Israel 2.0. Uh, the version of New Coke, if you remember that. Whatever you want to call it. That's what we're going to see. So come back for that. There's still plenty of food here. Grab seconds if you want. Otherwise, have a great week.